Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at Crusader Kings 3 and everything we know about lifestyles. Over the course of quite a few developer diaries, the folks over at Paradox have given us a lot of very interesting information to chew on. Role-playing is, in my opinion, and I'm sure in the opinions of many others, one of the things that makes Crusader Kings so very special. Lifestyles are going to be a core part of that, and so lifestyles will be the first topic we're going to cover in depth on this channel. Timestamps will be available in the description down below if you want to jump around at your leisure. And I'm super excited for the game, and this topic especially so, so let's not waste any more time, and let's dive in. Looking over lifestyles, we're going to see some familiar ideas, words, and concepts, but the devs are billing it as a completely new feature, since it's completely different and evolved from anything similar in Crusader Kings 2. We saw lifestyles and lifestyle focuses with the Way of Life DLC with CK2, and there seems to be a bit of crossover, though lifestyles now involve proper skill trees and gaining experience over time will allow you to unlock various perks down the different skill trees that each lifestyle provides, and each lifestyle provides three such trees. Going through these skill trees should allow for a fair bit of replayability, as picking different paths and perks should help create a fresh story every time. So as you can see, we're leaning a lot more heavily into RPG-style mechanics here, and so, yes, this may as well be a completely new feature. The five lifestyles are derived from the five attributes that all characters have. Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, Intrigue, and Learning. While lifestyle decisions only kick in as an adult, experiences during childhood can give a character affinity towards a specific lifestyle. Now, while this doesn't force your hand since you get to reset perks once per life, it might certainly push you to maintain a bit more control over the upbringing of your children, or at least of the one next in line. Another thing to consider is that the education stat of a character will directly affect the bonus experience gained. A stat of 1 is a bonus of 10%, with linear progression upwards, meaning the higher your education stat is, the quicker you'll be able to move down these trees. And when a character gets landed, they select a lifestyle and a focus, and they unlock perks depending on their age. The older they are, the more perks they unlock. When you pick a lifestyle, you choose a focus immediately, and the likely course of action early on is to pick a lifestyle and focus that reflects your immediate needs. These choices, as was the case with Crusader Kings 2, result in different events occurring over time, while also providing various modifiers to the character. In Crusader Kings 2, though, these events were merely stepping stones that would lead to increased stats for the attribute you were focusing on. In Crusader Kings 3, these events represent opportunities that arise because of your character's focus, sometimes presenting great opportunities, and at other times, presenting crises. A general example under stewardship with the domain focus talks about events that focus on the management of the realm and its holdings. A specific example that we've been given talks about dealing with corrupt tax officials and the options for doing so range from personal involvement to mass execution. One can imagine many such events for any one focus, and I wouldn't be surprised if any one such event would have multiple permutations as well. For example, here we see that the tax collector is a pretty clever man, able to hide the trail that leads to them. Perhaps a less clever individual would be easier to catch, in which case the options presented to you might be different. We don't know if this is the case, we don't know if this is how it'll actually work, and if there are permutations, it's just speculation on my part. And if it does work that way, that would lead to an impressive level of variety. Under Intrigue, with the Temptation focus, we're more likely to see events about seduction, desires, and covert behaviors. Leading courtiers on, playing people like puppets, trying to gain favors or cause issues for others, that sort of thing. As you can expect, this focus can lead to seducing lords and ladies and gaining favor with people of various courts. And if you'd like to pursue a life of long-term affairs, hedonism, and debauchery, well, this is the way to do it. The specific example we've been given is, once again, open to permutations. Would a more aggressive lover be more demanding, perhaps? But all talk of speculations aside, take a look at these two options. Discussing rumors about vassals and the request to speak to a third party. About what? For what purposes? It's very interesting. It's all about blackmail and schemes and learning secrets. You know, I love that stuff, so I'm really excited to see how many of these kinds of options exist. We also see what looks like the impact that these decisions have on stress levels. As a reminder, anytime you do something that doesn't quite align with your character, 
they can get stressed out, which can cause a multitude of issues. Learning with a scholarship focus will allow you to run experiments and maybe push the limits of what the church would allow. I don't know if they're planning on launching with supernatural elements, but I'm curious to see what kind of experiments we might see. The age-old quest of turning lead into gold is one such experiment, and even something as simple as this could perhaps have some major consequences. Could you get excommunicated for pushing your luck? Or does the game have those supernatural and less realistic elements and could you maybe hit a jackpot? Diplomacy, with a family focus, allows you to spend time on and with the dynasty, improving relations, enhancing prestige, and perhaps covering for the shortcomings of your less capable family members. It's cool to know that these rulers, despite your picking focuses for them, will still meander like real people might. Sometimes events from other focuses you haven't selected within that same lifestyle will pop up, and that's a nice way to mix things up. So here are all the focuses that all of the lifestyles provide. As we look through the finer points here, let's keep in mind that the game is still very much in development, which means literally everything is open for change. So let's make sure to take everything with a grain of salt, from the names of these focuses to the actual numbers involved and sometimes to what they are entirely. Now, no matter which focus you pick, picking one will give you a constant monthly flow of experience within that lifestyle choice. The amount of this experience varies depending on the lifestyle. This experience can in turn be used to unlock perks, with a final perk in any tree unlocking a new trait. But we'll touch on that later. Let's focus on focuses first. With diplomacy, focuses range from foreign affairs to majesty to family. Foreign affairs directly improves your diplomacy stat, while majesty does so to a lesser degree while also helping increase prestige. Finally, family splits the difference between boosts to diplomacy stat while also bumping fertility by a fair bit. We've seen an example of a family-related event already showing the need to maybe reprimand or otherwise guide members of the family, and I can see foreign affairs involving conversations and situations with representatives of other nations, including their nobility and royalty, while majesty might provide events focused entirely around one's own court. One interesting aspect of diplomacy-related events is that they are very heavily reliant on the target's personality. An example we were given is shown here, where a decision could go either way, but knowing that the target is a glutton, we're likely to get a positive response by providing extra food to eat. I really hope they get a little more complex than what we're seeing here, because this could make for an interesting situation of trying to figure out how personalities can translate to decisions. A glutton wanting more food is easy to connect the dots with, but if somebody is particularly pious as a Christian, Will they be upset because, you know, gluttony is a sin? There's lots of room for interesting stuff here. Under Martial, we have Strategy, Authority, and Chivalry as focus options. Strategy gives a solid boost to the Martial stat, while Authority does so to a lesser degree while also increasing the rate of control growth. As a reminder, control is a representation of your power over your counties, starting low for newly conquered territory and dropping when a county is under siege. A marshal can also be used to increase control, and it sounds like a low control will reduce productivity and might increase the likelihood of rebellion or general unhappiness in said county. Chivalry, finally, increases prowess, increases people's attraction to the character, and also adds to advantage. Prowess, again as a reminder, is similar to the combat rating in Crusader Kings 2, representing one's skill in battle. Advantage, meanwhile, is a number used in battle. When two armies face off, the one with the higher advantage gets a bonus equivalent to the difference between the two armies' advantages. There are some dice rolls involved and other factors affect advantage as well, but this is a surefire way of getting that extra leg up for a character who is likely to fight regularly. I think events here could present pretty interesting situations. Strategy could maybe become most active when the character is actually fighting battles, opening up new options to give you extra advantages and opportunities in battle. Authority is likely to see you dealing with issues in the realm, quashing rebellions and dissent, while chivalry might see you participating in duels and more formal events that help the prestige of your realm. Again, bit of speculation here. Under stewardship, your focus can be wealth, domain, or duty. They respectively give higher monthly income, a better stewardship stat, or a better stewardship stat 
alongside increased courtier and guest opinions. These all seem relatively simple and self-explanatory as far as what they chase after, and imagine the events they spawn will chase respectively, personal wealth, success of the nation, and duty to the people and the liege lord if there is one. Under Intrigue, focuses are split between Skullduggery, Temptation, and Intimidation. Skullduggery, or alternatively Trickery, gives a bump to the Intrigue stat and also increases Agent Acceptance, and I don't think it's been revealed exactly what that means, but it sounds like maybe it increases the likelihood of people joining your schemes? Not sure. Now, this focus is likely to bring events that are more focused on sneakier acts, blackmail, and getting secrets and things like that. Temptation increases fertility, adds an attraction bonus for people's opinion of the character, and also increases the power of seduction-related schemes. Seduction being something which is a lot more interesting now than it was in Crusader Kings 2, rather than the same cycle of events chasing after the people you fancy, Crusader Kings 3 actually considers how interested your target may be in somebody like you, and their rejections can actually be permanent should you annoy them or push your luck too far. Finally, the Intimidation focus increases the Intrigue stat, adds to the character's Dread stat, and also adds a Gain modifier. I wonder if that means that every time Dread would go up, it goes up by an extra amount because of this extra boost, that's what it seems to communicate. And again, just as a reminder, Dread is a new modifier, or stat I suppose, that scares people and might help keep people in check. Finally, with learning, there are the focuses for Medicine, Scholarship, and Theology. Medicine increases the learning stat and increases health by a little bit, Scholarship gives a much bigger learning boost, and Theology also increases the learning stat and, understandably, increases piety each month. I can imagine some pretty hilarious events spawning from Medicine. A Count, Duke, or King taking the medical issues of their court into their own hands, for example, performing experimental surgery on yourself, uh, the scholarship path will probably result in some pretty interesting learning opportunities and may instigate retaliation from the church, while on the flip side, theology will likely bring events that curry favor with the religious elite, but at what cost? With all that out of the way, let's talk about these skill trees and what they unlock. The diplomacy lifestyle will kick us off. It gives us a tree to increase relations with those closest to us, one to expand our borders through war and alliances, and one to increase our fame and prestige among our peers while giving subordinates somebody to look up to. The family hierarch tree focuses on familial relations and stat buffs related to family on one side, while offering opportunities for blooming friendships on the other. Right up top, Befriend unlocks a new scheme type, the Befriend Scheme. While there are other ways to make friends, this scheme sets you on a personal task to befriend a particular target and has a more consistent likelihood of success, though it does depend on your scheme's success chance as well as the target's personality and traits, much like seduction. Friendship is going above and beyond what it did in Crusader Kings 2. It'll be a much more active part of events and will also offer mechanical buffs and potentially debuffs, though the devs haven't suggested the latter, I just think it would make sense. It goes on to introduce stress reduction per friend, increased success chances, and the addition of two random skill points per friend. And on the flip side, Groom to Rule gives children between one and three extra skill points. Part of the family increases the opinion of close family members. Thicker than Water gives you a better chance of succeeding with personal schemes against your own family. And Sound Foundations gives you a random skill point for each living child you have. It all leads to the final step of the family hierarch trait, Patriarch for men and Matriarch for women, giving diplomacy buffs, increased fertility, reduction to stress gain, and improved close family opinion bonuses. Somebody who has completed this tree is very unlikely to be betrayed by their kin, and overall, this tree isn't too mechanically complex, though the number of random skill points it assigns should make for interesting growth potential for characters. The Diplomat Tree, perhaps predictably, mostly looks to relations with others outside of one's own nation, helping with opinions and unlocking diplomatic options, including new Casus Belli. With that said, it starts with the Thoughtful perk that just doubles opinion gain from any gifts you send to anybody, anywhere. Then, it promptly splits into three branches, Aggressive, Neutral, and Defensive. Let's start with Ducal Conquest. This Casus Belli should allow you to declare war on anybody who owns a county in a duchy whose title doesn't yet exist, and where you already have some holdings. 
this is a good way to pave the way for rapid expansion. Adaptive Traditions helps your Chancellors do their jobs better with a solid buff, while Defensive Negotiations is more about improving people's opinions, although it also unlocks the option to propose one alliance without the need for a marriage, something that can really come in handy if you're feeling threatened and might need some extra help. These three respectively go on to unlock the Vassalized Casus Belli that lets you declare war on an independent ruler with the intent of vassalizing them. Flexible Truces that reduces truce length and truce breaking penalties, meaning you can be a bit more aggressive with your moves, and Embassies that buff your diplomacy skill for each alliance that you have. Closer to the bottom of the tree is the Accomplished Forger perk that greatly increases the rate at which you can fabricate claims on counties, and at the end of it all is the Diplomat trait that boosts your diplomacy as well as independent ruler opinions, reflecting how much respect you command. Finally, under Diplomacy is the August tree. August meaning respected and impressive, and this tree really feels like it's about asserting yourself as the superior to others. The branches here, on the one hand, feel a lot more friendly, while on the other feel a lot more... Uh, maybe tyrannical? It starts with Benevolent Intent, increasing your ability to sway scheme power, or Firm Hand, increasing your prestige by 1% per level of dread every month. From there, Inspiring Rule increases prestige by a significant amount for each powerful vassal on your council, while Praetorian Guard increases prestige gained per knight you have. As you can see, one side is a lot more warlike and aggressive than the other. It all comes together with True Ruler though, increasing the likelihood of people accepting an offer of vassalization to serve you. Writing history follows and this unlocks a decision that sets off a series of events that has you commissioning the writing of a hopefully epic tale. The events will have you picking authors and budgets, and a well-written book can help increase prestige significantly. This then splits into a life of glory, hugely increasing the impacts of fame, and dignitas, giving a bump to diplomacy for each level of fame. It all ends with the August trait that increases martial as well as diplomacy, alongside a bump to monthly prestige gain. Next up, we have the Martial Trees. These are centered around mastery over direct, aggressive, and brutal warfare, the maintenance of order and security of the realm, and the pomp and ceremony of the more elegant type of warrior. The Strategist Tree is built around making you a master of war and the battlefield, and it begins with a perk that just drops the cost of Cassus Belly and subsequently makes it easier for you to go to war. This then immediately splits into three options. First of the three is Parthian Tactics, fittingly focused on buffing light and heavy cavalry as well as skirmishers. An increase in higher toughness means these units will be able to take more damage before dying, and increased pursuit means these units will be killing more of the enemy when they begin to flee at the end of a battle you've won. Finally, increased damage output is exactly that, increased damage dealt by the unit. This is clearly the option for the aggressive types. If you know you're going to win battles while having cavalry on hand, Parthian Tactics will help you completely obliterate the surviving troops on the retreat, furthering the impact of your success on the battlefield as you reduce their numbers for future battles. Organized March will buff movement speed and increase the screening ability of heavy infantry, pikemen, archers, and skirmishers. Movement speed should help your army to not only cut off enemy movements, but also steer clear of them where necessary, and the increased screening stat is very helpful for when you face a tough situation on the battlefield. The screen stat is used to protect your own fleeing troops after you've lost a battle, increasing the number that survive a lost battle. Engineered for destruction increases naval speed and siege weapon effectiveness significantly. This should really help provide alternate routes of attack to bypass enemy forts, and should you be stuck against one, this should help ease the pain of the long wait of a siege battle. This is followed by Envelopment that buffs how well your men-at-arms counter the appropriate troops, Hit and Run that reduces losses when retreating while also modifying heavy infantry and archer damage output, as well as heavy infantry and pikemen toughness. This should allow you to order a retreat with a little more confidence since that's a big reduction in losses taken on the retreat. And then finally comes living off the land and that helps you with raiding and also increases your supply capacity, both things that should really help on a prolonged campaign away from large urban centers that can sustain your armies. 
All this is followed by sappers, which is basically you handing shovels to your heavy infantry, pikemen, archers, and skirmishers, and telling them to dig. They all bump up your siege progress and just help make those, you know, long, arduous sieges and quicker, hopefully. And finally, the strategist trait at the end of this tree boosts diplomacy as well as martial, while also allowing you to freely cross water and increasing the number of deaths enemies suffer in battle against you. I'm not sure what freely crossing water is limited to. I imagine it's crossing rivers without penalties, not crossing entire seas or oceans. The Overseer tree is more about, as the name suggests, overseeing and defending your own realm, maintaining control, and shutting down dissidents and outside aggressors. Starting with Serve the Crown, giving a slight increase to control every month, we see the tree split into a woman's home or a man's home, giving a pretty hefty bump to your combat advantage when defending on territory you control, and Strict Organization, which gives a big bump to control as well. Enduring Hardships bumps up fort level by 1 and stops enemy occupation from reducing control, increasing your survivability against sieges, while Hard Rule helps you shut down dissidents, increasing your siege progress rate against revolts, and also reducing the discontent level of independence and liberty factions, ensuring that your vassals won't be as likely to want to dissociate with you. Further down, we see the reduction of army maintenance costs and the increase of reinforcement rates for levies in friendly territory on one side, and reduced mercenary hire cost on the other. This finally comes together with absolute control that allows you to use absolute control in counties, increasing taxes by 10%, and levies for as long as possible with absolute control active. Finally, the Overseer trait at the end of this tree boosts martial, stewardship, and control growth. Gallant sounds like a ton of fun, turning your character into a charming beacon of chivalry, either as a romantic or as a warrior. Stalwart Leader kicks us off by increasing prowess and reducing the likelihood of unfortunate events happening when commanding armies. This then leads to Courtship, increasing the power and success chances of your Romance and Elope schemes, with Chivalric Dominance next to it, increasing the efficiency of your Knights instead. Romance schemes sound really fun, having you pine after your target in a courtly manner, and if you succeed, the two of you become soulmates, which is like lovers but more powerful. Then, on top of that, you can try and elope, especially if your target's liege may not approve of the marriage. The downside is that you have to make sure you don't get caught, and on top of that, you actually have to love each other through the union, unlike a traditional marriage. Eloping might be a good way to get a spouse that would otherwise be out of your reach for the purposes of their stats or potential claims and holdings down the line. Back to the tree, further down we see promising prospects that increases the likelihood of a marriage getting accepted, while never back down on the other side reduces friendly casualties and also increases advantage in battle. Following that, loyalty and respect increases your spouse's opinion of you and increases their contribution to the skill-based counselor tasks as well. And this can be absolutely huge if you manage to snag a spouse with amazing stats to bolster your own. On the other side, King's Guard increases the number of knights you have. It all comes together with Peacemaker, increasing peace acceptance by 10, meaning you can sometimes force peace that gives you a better deal than it otherwise would. You're just that charming, I guess. The Gallant trait at the end of this tree bumps up your monthly prestige gain, increases people's opinion of you because of attraction, and also gives a bump to martial and prowess. I'm just going to quote the dev diary because I thought this was a hilarious piece of writing. With all this helping you along, neither foe nor maiden will stand a chance. Stewardship trees deal with finer aspects of managing and maintaining the realm, off the battlefield, and in the world of wealth, development, and people. These trees allow you to maximize money through savory and unsavory means, better maintain and improve a larger domain than otherwise permitted, or get more out of the people below and above your standing. Avaricious is focused on the accumulation of wealth, starting with golden obligations that allows you to demand payments for hooks. Hooks, as a reminder, are an interesting evolution of favors from CK2, and we'll talk about them in more depth in a later video, but they basically allow you to manipulate people if you have something on them. Blackmail, for example, is a good hook that you can exploit. So, demanding payment is an example of a way to use these hooks, and since dynasty heads gain hooks on all other dynasty members, 
this can be a quick source of income when needed. Or you can literally blackmail people for money, there's that too. Further down, here Geld increases vassal tax contributions, while War Profiteer increases income significantly while you're at war. And it is my domain lets you just literally demand money from your vassals, holdings, courtiers, etc, etc. It sounds like this overstepping might come with consequences as there are decisions to be made, which vassal you're targeting and how heavy your demands are, for example. Detailed ledgers increases opinions and tax contributions of Republicans. Fearful troops reduces the cost of maintaining men at arms based on how dreaded you are. And golden aplum increases your monthly income based on your stress level. And this honestly just sounds like being a YouTuber. Please like and subscribe. It all comes together with at any cost that lets you just sell titles for money. Not landed titles, but meaningless ones instead. Costing prestige, but gaining you wealth. At the end of it all, you unlock the Avaricious trait, which increases monthly gold income as well as stewardship, which if I recall correctly, also affects your wealth. The Architect tree looks after construction and development of the realm, starting with either Taxman that increases the effectiveness of collecting taxes, or with cutting cornerstones for sizable reductions in the cost of building and holding construction. Following that, defensive measures on one side increases fort levels by one, and also increases your garrison size, while the professional workforce instead reduces the construction time of buildings and holdings. This is followed by organized muster rolls to double levy reinforcement rate on one hand, or increase development in the realm capital on the other. As you can see, part of this tree so far is a bit more open-ended in its interpretation of architect as a metaphor, while the other part is a bit more literal in its focus on construction and development, which I've always understood to mean more generic urbanization. After all that, it comes together with popular figurehead that just increases your popular opinion significantly, divided attention lets you have more holdings in your domain before trouble starts brewing, and then it all culminates in the architect trait that grants a bonus to stewardship and also reduces building construction time. Administrator is all about fulfilling your obligations as a person in charge of the realm, starting with the rather aggressive meritocracy option for those wanting to make a power grab. It lets you use the claim throne scheme against your liege to get a claim on the realm. The scheme uses agents and relies on learning and intrigue stats, so it's not an easy one to pull off against a liege who has access to better stock. A bold strategy likely to result in at least a few rolling heads. Right after, the tree splits into two, with Chains of Loyalty increasing the efficiency of your Chancellor's efforts to improve relations at home, and large levies on the other side to get, you guessed it, larger levies from your vassals. This is followed by Likeable on one side, increasing your opinion among direct vassals and your liege alike, and Soon Forgiven on the other, reducing your tyranny a bit every month, affording you some wiggle room with more tyrannical actions. Finally, the splits end with positions of power to increase your counselor's opinions of you, and toe the line, reducing the likelihood of vassals joining independence factions. So, on one side we see a focus on managing opinions, and on the other, a focus on keeping people in check, despite potentially low opinions. It comes together with honor to serve, increasing the tax and levy contributions of vassals who are happy and powerful, or in other words, a powerful vassal who sits on the council. Now making them happy, according to the dev diary, is quite the challenge. The administrator trait at the end of it all increases vassal opinions of you and also reduces build costs a little bit. Intrigue has, in my opinion, always been one of the more intriguing aspects of Crusader Kings 2, and the trees in Crusader Kings 3 just add more flavor to what was already great. The trees are separated into seduction, torture, and schemes. In CK3, Seduction goes well above and beyond what it was in CK2, requiring you to be concerned with the personalities of the people you're targeting and forcing you to be careful lest an annoyed target rats you out. So the seducer tree is there to help with a couple of branches, one that seems to imply raw charisma, while the other definitely feels a lot more underhanded and not in the hot way. Like weeds in a garden increases your fertility, while enticing opportunity increases your seduction scheme power. These are followed by unshackled lust to remove attraction penalties from your seduction schemes on one side, and home advantage on the other to increase your chances of succeeding against your courtiers and even guests by a whopping 
Then we have subtle desire to uh, reduce the incestuous penalty from your schemes, and graceful recovery to stop critical failures on your schemes that might cause you to get caught or otherwise completely lose the opportunity to seduce a potential target. The last steps of the branch bring mortal adoration to prevent your lovers from joining murder schemes against you, even warning you or saving you in the case of an attempt, while on the other side, Smooth Operator bumps up your seduction scheme success chances. These branches all come together to grant you the seducer trait, with the last step increasing intrigue, fertility, and attraction opinions. The next tree focuses on torture, and apart from gaining dread through torture, it can also be used to gain secrets, though it comes at the cost of piety and clergy opinion outside of where your faith is okay with torture. Once again, starting with two branches, one that seems like it's for people who perform torture cleanly and with reason, and another that looks like it's for the more sadistic sort. Dark Insights increases the chance of gaining intrigue or prowess through torture as you learn more about the human body, while Dreadful simply increases your dread by a massive amount, suggesting less precise work. Divine Retribution removes the piety and clergy opinion penalties from torture and execution, almost validating your work in the eyes of God, while Thriving in Chaos increases your martial, intrigue, and prowess per stress level. Again, some seriously masochistic tendencies in here to go with the sadistic elements. A little bit of s &M. These come together for Malice Implicit to increase how much dread you gain per level of tyranny, and Fear Tax that increases the taxes and levies you receive from your vassals depending on how intimidated they are. The tree splits again to give you Forever Infamous to help reduce the decay of your hard-earned dread, while Prison Feudal Complex makes it easier for you to get prisoners to work with. Finally, it all comes together with the Torturer trait on the last perk, giving slight boosts to Levy and Prowess, with more increases to Dread yet again. Finally, there's the Schemer tree, which is for the more subtle types. Starting with Truth is Relative, a hilariously named perk that allows you to just fabricate hooks, and also allows for the fabrication of hooks when trying to find secrets. I think the term fabricate here very clearly implies that these are lies that you found convincing ways to prove is true, so as far as the world and your target would be concerned, they may as well be. It immediately splits into three branches, one for obtaining secrets, one with a more defensive angle, and one for murder. Digging for dirt makes it quicker for your spy master to find secrets, Court of Shadows increases the effectiveness of the Disrupt Schemes task, and Swift Execution increases Murder Scheme power rather significantly. Further down, Kidnapper allows you to use the Abduction Scheme to kidnap targets, and while it's a secret at first, success leads to instant discovery. Prepared for Anything reduces the success chances of enemy hostile schemes against you and your courtiers, and a job done right increases the chance of success for your own hostile schemes. These branches come together with Twice Schemed, which increases the number of hostile schemes you can chase at a time from 1 to 2, and then it all finishes off with a Schemer trait that boosts your intrigue as well as your scheme power, speeding up your ability to execute schemes. And finally, we have the Learning and Lifestyle, with trees split between those that wish to remain faithful, one that focuses on health and well-being, and one that ties a bit more with the concept of wisdom, and knowledge for the sake of knowledge itself. The Theologian Tree makes you more popular among the faithful, starting with a bump to clergy opinion, followed by an immediate split that focuses on the effects of your faith on your realm on one side, and the effects of the same on people's opinion of you on the other. Zealous Proselytizer increases the rate at which people in a county are converted, while Clerical Justifications increases the efficiency of the Religious Relations task. Then comes Religious Icon, which further helps in conversions, next to Church and State, which actually exists in two forms, one that increases your opinion with the Realm Priest, and another, if you are of a faith that doesn't have a Realm Priest, that instead doubles your monthly piety from buildings. These are followed by Profit on one side, though we haven't been shown it yet, so we don't know what the details are, but it looks like for non-profit religious organizations, the option is replaced with Apostate on one side, reducing the cost of converting faith and radiant on the other, increasing the effects of your level of devotion. I'm kind of puzzling the trees together here, so I might be wrong about the placement of these, and for that I apologize. 
Nonetheless, it all becomes clear after the two branches join to give Defender of the Faith, bringing with it a drop in tyranny gain and increased opinion for people of the same faith. This perk is different depending on your religion, and you can see the Muslim variant here increasing diplomacy per level of devotion alongside monthly piety. And finally, the tree is capped with a theologian trait that buffs learning as well as piety. Whole of body is next, and it starts off with a way to improve your court physician right at the start with anatomical studies, reducing the cost to hire said physician and also increasing the outcomes of their treatments. This is followed by three branches, one focused on mental health, one on self-awareness, and one on disease. Carefree reduces stress gain significantly, while restraint allows you to embrace or abandon celibacy, a good alternative to a vasectomy or tubectomy, preventing the production of too many competing heirs. And then, wash your hands just reduces the chances of you or your courtiers contracting illnesses. The next step brings mental resilience to increase the time between mental breaks your character might have when getting stressed out. Know thyself, which literally warns you when you're a year away from dying of natural causes, allowing you to prepare for the inevitability. And Iron Constitution, that increases disease resistance, something that only really becomes active when you've fallen sick. It basically prevents a disease from making you infertile and reduces the likelihood of you dropping dead from dysentery too quickly. These all come together to give you the healthy perk, which gives a huge boost to your chances of surviving in general, outside of being murdered, of course, and then it all comes to an end with whole of body, a trait that increases your fertility and health while reducing your stress gain. Finally, the scholar tree begins with two branches, one that's a bit more socially inclined and another that is a bit more scientifically inclined. Pedagogy gives your wards additional skills and also gives you a chance of befriending them, an interesting way to potentially turn an enemy nation into a friend over the course of a generation, with the help of some kidnapping perhaps. Scientific, on the other hand, increases the progress of a mysterious thing called cultural fascination. We don't yet know what that means. Next. Open-minded on one side completely removes negative culture opinions, while planned cultivation increases the efficiency of your attempts to increase development in a county. To end the branches, we see apostate on one end, this time a little different, increasing different faith opinion and reducing faith conversion costs, while scholarly circles on the other side increases learning per level of devotion, the inevitable tie between faith and education at the time. This all comes together with Learn on the Job, which transfers a portion of your counselor's primary skills to add to your own, giving an extra reason to have counselors with high primary stats where it matters. This is followed by Sanctioned Loopholes, which allows you to trade piety for religiously approved claims on titles, which ultimately gives you a right to take it by force, if necessary. And then this is all capped off with a Scholar trait that gives a big boost to learning, with smaller boosts to hostile and personal scheme power, while also increasing development growth in your counties. And that wraps it up, ladies and gentlemen. Five different lifestyles, each with three focuses and three trees to explore and make decisions on, and they all sound very intriguing in their own ways. Writing this script had me think of multiple different first playthroughs I'd like to do on the channel, and I'm very curious as a result. Seeing these options all laid out in front of you, what are your plans for your first game's starting character? Is there anything you're particularly curious about exploring? I, I was always into the whole seduction thing, especially with other players' wives in multiplayer, so I'm excited to see that further developed, but I'm also really curious about the fleshed-out lifestyle events, the romance of chivalry and torture. Needless to say, I'm pretty pumped about quite a few of these options, so I really want to know what y'all think. Now, if you'd like to see more Crusader Kings 3 coverage, make sure you subscribe to the channel, as there's going to be plenty to come. Crusader Kings 2 changed how I look at the whole genre, so you can bet I'm excited to play CK3 as soon as possible. A massive thanks goes out to all of my channel members and patrons for supporting the channel on a monthly basis, and a big ol' thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.